I'm joined now by Global Affairs Analyst Shego Daniel for more on the war between Israel and Palestine. Thank you for talking to us on the news this hour. It's the third visit of Mr. Blinken to Israel since the Hamas attack on Israel on the 7th of October. Uh, it, the U.S. seemed to be saying we're on Israel's side, but the latest message is the need to protect um, civilians in Gaza. How important is this change in focus? Well, thank you for inviting me. Uh, the United States, as well as most of its allies in the West, have remained undoubted in their uh, steadfast support for the nation of Israel. And I think this is what is reiterated by the third visit of the uh, Mr. Blinken to Israel today, and having the meeting with the uh, Israeli Prime Minister, as well as top government official there, uh, is granted the interviews. And uh, largely, the content of that interview is to repeat the same effort, the same position that the uh, United States hold. However, there have been a new development, particularly from the United States Senate, where 13 members of the Senate have cautioned on the government to, uh, to have a discussion with Israel where there can be a position to the ongoing military activities of Israel, giving room for humanitarian uh, access. If Israel is going to back down on that, it's still unknown. Because the last statement by the Prime Minister is to dismiss it and said they are going on with their uh, planned military uh, invasion of Gaza. So maybe as time rolls down, uh, we will get a clear picture because it's not United States that is at war. United States is just the backup. Mm. The whole decision rests on Israel. It's hard to tell how Israel intends to move on from here if it disagrees with the United States on a ceasefire, which of course has gotten majority support from the United Nations. But just a few minutes earlier, we heard from the Secretary General of um, Hezbollah who just addressed um, citizens in Lebanon and is now mm -hmm. praising the October 7 Hamas attack on Israel, uh, indeed calling it um, a well, fully planned and executed operation. What are the concerns about this snowballing into a major regional war? Uh, well, um, the, the content of the Hezbollah uh, she described that uh, leader is, to the best of my knowledge, to inflame the situation. Uh, the best that I come out today is from the Minister of UAE, which, uh, where she bring the attention of all concern in this Israeli mass war, that attention should be given to the wider, uh, wider effect that this. Uh, this conflict, pardon me, please. Uh, the wider effect that the conflict could snowball into. And that's something everyone should give a concern to. Um, the Hezbollah's leaders, uh, praise of the Hamas, to the best of my knowledge, will only inflamed or put more uh, strength of conviction to the Israelis poster that Hamas need to be eradicated, to be destroyed, to be put in oblivion, never for it to ever exist again. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, because of the strategy in achieving that, how do you extricate the Hamas group from among the civilian Palestinians? Israel itself has claimed that the tactics of Hamas is to use human shield. That means you cannot distinguish, you cannot easily separate who Hamas members are from the member of the Palestinian public who are in Gaza. So this is the difficulty, is the conundrum. And if Israel has focused that I need to destroy Hamas, the uh, collateral damage to reaches many Palestinian lives too will be lost. Absolutely. Um, as we speak now, it's perhaps the first time we're hearing from uh, Hassan Nasrallah uh, since Hamas' attack on Israel. It's perhaps his first public appearance even since 2006. And we're hearing mm -hmm. there are attacks already in northern Israel 
being launched by Hezbollah in Lebanon. Uh, talk to us about the dynamics of this war, particularly where you consider the position that has been taken by majority of the countries in the UN calling for a ceasefire. Which one is expected to come first, the release of the hostages by Hamas or Israel taking a step backward for the sake of um, humanitarian intervention? Now, um, these are all piece of pawns in the chess game. The Hamas wants to use the hostage that they have taken, the people kidnapped during their onslaught on October 7 against Israel, as a bargaining chip. Israel has taken a position of eradicating Hamas. But in doing so, they are conscious of the backlash that will arise from inside of Israel if doing so will amount to killing their own people who have been kidnapped by the Hamas group. Mm -hmm. So there is a room for negotiation there, which apparently will play into the strong hand of Hamas. And Hamas in this case, after the several bombardments, now is stepping up that that particular hostage taking will be a trade-off. A trade-off for allowing humanitarian pause, I mean humanitarian corridor for shipments of uh, humanitarian aid, as well as a pause or ceasefire to the bombardment. Israel doesn't want that, but Israel does, at, the, at the same time does not want to risk the lives of his, of his citizens who are in the hostage situation. So that gives a leverage for a negotiation. But we should look at the bigger picture. Whether the negotiation for the hostages took place and succeed or not, has it removed from the table the position of Israel that we need to annihilate Hamas? Uh. That's, the, that's, that's the bedrock of it. If you said, let somebody negotiate with me to give humanitarian access, but the deepest part of it is, if you had allowed that, it could be in a week, a month or two, he is insisted, I need to take you out. I need to destroy you. So that threat is still there. How do we manage that? And that is what the UAE uh, minister have just referred to. Indeed. That these mm. positions to snowballed into a wider problem. And we all know that the backer of the Hezbollah who are already threatening Israel on their northern border, is Iran. Mm. So Iran too could be factored into the picture. Hamas wanted to separate the ongoing, steady, beautiful, mm. uh, sound relationship that Saudi Arabia have started to build with uh, Israel. Because if they snowballed into an Arab problem, Saudi Arabia will be pressured to seize position. Indeed. in terms of creating further relationship with Israel. The update we're receiving now is that Israeli military says it's surrounded Gaza and it's also attacking major Hamas infrastructure. However, it is not clear whether these attacks have been, you know, surgically accurate in attacking just the targets, seeing the number of children that have died in the past weeks and also casualties on the part of civilians. Now, what's the implication of this on politics at home, both for the prime minister and even the U.S. president, who is uh, going to have to return to the ballot? There are concerns about losing support with the Muslim, you know, citizens in America. How do you expect this to change the dynamics in the coming days? Um, well, I think... The American situation, let's take the American situation first. Americans over decades have shown a strong support for this nation of Israel, the state of Israel. Um, there have been recent time, there have been a lot of concern and people who actually empathize with the situation of uh, the Palestinians. And I don't think, because of the strong influence that is Israel has positioned itself in American politics, that such sympathy will really sway so much of American politics into, uh, into any difficult situation for neither the, uh, the, the Democrats or the Republicans. As long as they maintain their support for Israel, 
I think the whichever party that insisted, both of them are insisting on supporting uh, Israel. Whether it is, if you hear from the Republican side, it's a support for Israel. If we hear from the Democrat side, it's a support for Israel. So what I'm simply saying is, it doesn't matter. If they said Biden's situation, I mean Biden administration that is currently on now, is supporting Israel, are you going to vote Republican? Who are openly supporting as well? So that, to me, could pay to the American situation. There will be condemnation. And that has been my own worries about this whole thing, that we're looking at just maybe temporary solutions to this issue. These have come up for the past 75 years. All meaningful ideas, meaningful suggestions, meaningful uh, po policies, positions to resolve it have not, have not worked. And why has it not worked? It has not worked because the Israeli government, the Israeli state, had always worked against those ideas. The first being a single nation named either Palestine or named as Israel. We are all members, Arab, Jews, or whoever, that are nationals, have equal rights. Absolutely. Where they all live in Nam together. Indeed. That was not sustainable because Israel did not allow that. Then came the idea of two-state policy. Let there be two countries appearing, living, existing side by side. The Arab-Palestinian nation, the Jewish-Israeli nation. You agree Israel that both countries, Israel. both countries, you know, permit me to butt in because of time, both countries seem to have shown yeah. hesitation to all of these um, suggestions in the past years. Um, even Palestine had come up to say, well, we want everything from the rivers to the sea. The same sentiment has also been shared uh, back in Israel. So it's interesting how all of the solutions haven't resonated with the parties involved. But I'm afraid that's our time. We'll continue this conversation uh, sometime later. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us, Global Affairs Analyst Shago Daniel. You're welcome. Thank you very much for having me. And thank you. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. Absolutely.